So welcome to today's edition of Route 664, The Road to Human Kindness. I'm Les Winston. I'm the national spokesperson for social charity.org that's social se charity.org which is a project of the endow american network foundation it's a 501c3 organization that has as its principal objective to endow america using the charitable vehicles that were given to us by the internal revenue service that people are not using and um, that we want to change the way uh, non-governmental organizations are supported. We think they should be supported by their own endowments and those endowments can be built using the tools that Congress gave us. My guest this morning is a very uh, interesting person. I've had a chance to read some of your um, some of your statements. John Pelletier is the director of Champlain's Center for Financial Literacy. Champlain is in Vermont, is that right? Yes, that's correct. It's a college uh, in Burlington, Vermont. Great. I'm going to you, you have a, 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 a statement here. Too many of our children aren't learning important personal financial skills at home or school. And then you follow that with parents are nearly as uncomfortable talking to their kids about money as they are about sex. <laughs> uh, tell me about that. What, what, what's, what's, what's behind that? Why, why are the adults uh, not sharing? I, you know, I think a part of it is they make mistakes, right? Uh, you, you know, when, when you when you look at financial literacy in general, uh, the surveys. What well, here's what we know: the older you get, the more financial literate you become. Why? Because of the school of hard knocks. So uh, it's actually you know, it's it's a, it's a it's a it's a curve, just like you would expect. Very young people are are the least financially literate. Older people are are, are the most uh, that increased level of sophistication comes through making mistakes. And, and uh, you know, I don't think parents are maybe comfortable telling kids about the mistakes they made. I, you know, I think we can all point to some financial mistake we've made that we regret uh, on any, uh, uh, you know, do the kids, do the kids know the financial mistake because they're living through with the parents and that's, and they're, they're sensitive to that or. They they may. I think it depends on the household, right? Uh, yeah. They they may. I mean, if you're if you're in a household where, uh, um, you, you, you know, um, you, you're getting credit calls all the time from from people, you know, trying to recover debt uh, mm-hmm. on the phone, then I'm, I'm sure the child is aware of it. But you, you know, some of it is, is is parents are just uncomfortable. I think part of it is society. We're we're reluctant to talk about money. Uh, yeah. It's it's an uncomfortable topic. Um, you know, the surveys are, have been taken with parents uh, by a couple of different groups. And it's always interesting to me that the the talking to their kids about money is almost as frequent to happen as talking to their kids about sex. And just, just think about that for a second, that we as a society are, are we're probably as uncomfortable talking about personal financial issues as we are uh, about about mm-hmm. sex. That's probably well, we- we represent, you know, when we're when we're talking to uh, clients about philanthropy in general, because uh, that's what this the uh, Route 664, the Road to Human Kindness, is about philanthropy. And um, I want to put in, actually put a pin through that because I wanted to ask you about that in your in your curriculum that I've seen that was put out for uh, I think it's a guideline as to how financial literacy should be taught. Sure. And um, when we're dealing with when we're dealing with philanthropy, we have a pyramid. The pyramid is a confidence pyramid. And at the very bottom of the confidence pyramid, pyramid, pyramid is the individual must have confidence over money. And once confidence over money is achieved, they can then have confidence over their time and the relationships and eventually get to spirituality and get to working at their genius. And so when, we're, when we are talking about confidence over money, that's the base of everything. Is money the root of all evil? I don't think so. Uh, I, you know, I think if if money's the opposite, right? If you have enough money that uh, you're not worrying about where the next paycheck, if you're not living paycheck to paycheck, they're they're. I mean, I think studies show the opposite. It, it, giving yourself infinite amounts of money will not make you infinitely happy. But there's a point at which having that ability to not worry about how you're going to handle a financial crisis. And and the real thing that's disturbing with uh, many of the surveys done, the Fed does uh, an annual survey uh, where where they ask, you know, how would you come up with 
$2,000 if you had an emergency. There's other groups that have surveys, national surveys that ask $400. And, and, and the reality is people, too many people, maybe as much as 40% of people, uh, 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 would struggle to figure out how they would cover a $2,000 emergency. Um, that's what bearing, that's what, bearing what bearing do you think that has on the mental health of the country? Oh, you, you know, look, uh, a lot, a lot. I think so. We start with marital stress. A lot of marital stress is financial in nature. Uh, you know, if you have two people who have uh, different values of, of uh, one's a saver, one's a, a spender, uh, that's going to create marital stress. But but beyond that, if you look within the workplace itself, uh, there there are many surveys that are done looking at uh, stress that exists in the workplace that literally takes away from productivity. So an example would be, you know, if you're if you're if you have to put a parent in a nursing home, maybe you're not as productive that month as you're trying to deal with that crisis or you have a family member is going through health issues but one of the greatest stressors in the workplace is financial people are worried about how they're going to pay the mortgage how they're going to pay the utilities and that impacts productivity so it's it's uh i think it's a huge a, a huge issue that uh um and again, I, I want to be clear, financial literacy isn't a panacea. Just because you're financially literate doesn't mean everyone's going to be financially well off. Uh, but no, you, but, but uh, what's the objective, though? The objective is to teach them the basic skills yeah. necessary. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the objective, the, the objective is to get them, you know, particularly, uh, although I think it should be in grades K through 12, high school is the place where if it's going to happen, in a state that is where it happens from a policy standpoint uh and and you know they they need to learn uh, uh about a couple of things you know i uh, there 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 are a small number that i think at a minimum they must know about what one, one is credit right and credit scores if, if you know how your credit score works and you can modify your behaviors to maximize your credit scores you will probably save yourselves uh hundreds of thousands of dollars over your lifetime in interest payments by having a lower rate on a mortgage, lower rates on your automobile loan or lease, lower rates on your credit cards. Uh, the other thing is budgeting. You have to have some minimal budgeting skill. Uh, you need to understand compound interest. Uh, their numeracy is lacking in our schools today, and it's hard to become financially literate without numeracy. And I'll give you one great you know example I use. If you're if 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 your grandmother, uh, you're 17, and your grandmother gives you ten thousand dollars and begs you to put it in a low cost S and P 500 index fund from Vanguard, and you don't teach it, touch it until you're 67, if your money can double every decade which is about a 7.2% return, you know, mm -hmm. average annual. If your money can double every decade and you don't touch that money, how much money do you have when you're 67? And and you'll you'll ask students, that's five decades, right, of compounding. They have no idea. They'll give you all sorts of answers, usually right. nowhere near the right number. But it's it's literally three hundred and twenty thousand dollars. That's the power of compounding, and, and it's the reason you do need to put money away for retirement uh, when, when you're younger. So there, there are some basic things people need to know to be successful. The other thing that really worries me is probably the biggest decision we ask people to make is around the age of 18. We're asking young people to decide whether to enter the workforce and not seek any post-secondary degree education to go into the military or to go to some level of post-secondary degree education, which could include college, community college, uh, technical education, certifications, things of that nature. And, and, and when they make that choice, which, you know, about 60 to 70 percent of kids make that choice to seek that post-secondary degree education, we know that about two thirds of them are taking on debt. How do they even know what they want to do? Well, that's I, I actually think the career career and education exploration focus and college exploration focus is an area that's lacking. And, and people may not realize this. That's a key. We have national standards on financial literacy. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, they've been they used to be separate, but now they they've combined. Uh, both the Council for Economic Education, the Jumpstart National Coalition, has right. come out with national uh, standards on education, just like the Common Core English and Math. And it's very clear a, a key concept in there is career exploration. Yeah. Uh, and um, I, I actually think we fail on that in, in, in many schools. Yeah, I saw you break it down. You you show the individual that they can improve their earning capacity by taking on additional skills, learning different things. And I, and you would think that that would be basic. Uh, that would kind of be common sense. Um, but I don't think I don't think I think the world, unfortunately, the world has become so bottom line that it doesn't really take into account all of the other factors that go into life. And uh, and I think the financial literacy that you're um are you part of jumpstart was that your is that yours jumpstart? no no i don't we're, we're, we we partner with jumpstart they're, they're an independent organization they both have uh many state uh affiliates as does uh, the council for economic education and then they have mm-hmm. the national group uh i'm very friendly with the, the ceo of that laura levine and- well i'd love to see you add philanthropy to that um curriculum um because to me, the philanthropy or the philanthropic thought process is, uh, you know, taking everybody a little bit away from the bottom line, but also how it can be used to increase all of the other things because the government really wants that done. If a youngster knows that they can use a charitable trust, for example, from the time that they're young to sure. accumulate money for retirement purposes, and at the end of their life, they can direct where that's going to go into the community that's a pretty powerful uh, message. And so one of the things we want to do with Route 664 is to get youngsters involved in thinking about how philanthropy works, because we, um, as my uh, co-host Wanda talks about all the time, it's the missing piece, the missing P-E-A-C-E. And I think peace of mind is what you're also stressing. Uh, You're your program was, I find it a very, a very uh, interesting and complete way of looking at financial literacy. When, yes, when you're, um, when you try, I know Vermont originally had a very low score yes. when it came to financial literacy. So how did you change that? Well, it still does have a fairly low score. I mean, we're, <laughs> we, sorry. So we're, okay. we're, <laughs> <laughs> so we're known, we're known for a couple of things. We actually come out with a national report card periodically uh where we grade state public policy on what's required in in high schools and so the last report we did vermont got a d it'll go up to a c um and and but the good news is nationally what's going on there nationally very good things are going on uh in in june of 2019 there were only five states in the nation that required uh, a standalone course in personal finance as a high school graduation requirement so you have to take basically 60 hours, uh, you know, half of a Carnegie unit in, in course uh, in class time in, in this topic to, to graduate. And that was Virginia, Tennessee, Missouri, Alabama, and Utah. Since that time, just since June of 2019, and it had been that way going back to, say, 2013, not a mm-hmm. lot had changed. Stagnant at five. Giant change. Today, uh, we're, we're looking at arguably 14 states that uh have this requirement now some of them are implementing and it may take them two or three years but yeah, they florida, have- florida just desantis i think in march of this year yeah, uh, may, uh, may 22nd may 22nd uh yeah, may. governor desantis signed that bill uh yeah. but florida florida's new just in the last 90 to 100 days uh it's michigan florida and georgia and so yeah. at, you know so you, you've got a lot of states there you've got uh ohio north carolina uh, Iowa, Mississippi, Nebraska, and Rhode Island. Uh, uh, you know, so there's a lot of states, a lot of activity. Great news is those are states collectively with nearly five million high school students, That's which great. means that more than a million kids, if you assume one fourth, are taking this a year. We're going to be moving into a world where about. Uh, 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 a million plus students a year are going to be required to take a standalone course. And and we know that plenty of studies have been done that look at these types of mandates. And what do they show? They show that when kids get this education in school, measurable differences in 
uh, credit scores. We can see before before the mandate and after credit scores are going up. We can see 90 day default rates going down in, in young people, say 22 and under. We, we can also measure what their behaviors are with regard to how they use student loans. Are they maximizing Pell Grants? Are they maximizing federal student loans before getting private student loans? Mm -hmm. And we even have credit card data that shows that when students go through this in these states with better standards, they have lower credit card debt coming out of college than those coming from jurisdictions that don't have these mandates. Mm -hmm. This stuff works and you can demonstrate it with data. That's great. I, I, I think that it's a major change, but I, you know, we, um, we always talk about, um, socio that we've gone through a kind of a socio-political fracture where politics is not going to be the ruling force anymore but economics is going to be the ruling force and where individuals need to have economic stability sure. more importantly than worrying about what the politics is going to do to them they see the effects of politics right now unfortunately and the earning i mean the earning capacity I mean, folks who are in Social Security, who are living on Social Security, and that's, that was about roughly 50% of the retired population in the United States lives on Social Security. For them not to recognize that they've taken a 20% cut in benefits as a result of inflation, and as a result of lending and borrowing and all the things that are wrong, hopefully your financial literacy uh, approach is going to make a is making a significant change, I believe. My guest is John Pelletier. John is the uh, director of Champlain's Center for Financial Literacy in Vermont, and uh, is very is very uh, instrumental and very um, I would say at the top of the list of movers and shakers in the in this area of getting young people to be become financially literate. It makes it makes for a better population overall if people are happier and have peace of mind, and they get that through. Unfortunately, they get it through money, but. There's a way that you can control that. If yeah. uh, you know, if you if you're brought up and you think that it just comes from heaven, and or if you walk into the room and you ask your parents for it, that's how it appears. That's a problem. So, John, um, give me the if you were sitting with me three years from today, what what would you be uh, happy about as far as progress is concerned in in this whole area of financial literacy? Yeah, so there, there, there are a couple of things. So, uh, uh, you know, I'd love it to, uh, you know, in a perfect world, right? We don't expect people to take one class in, in French or Spanish and be fluent, right? So you'd love, you'd love to see this migrate down and be embedded. Uh, mathematics is a great place for it in K through eight. Uh, so that would be one thing. Uh, you know, there's a group of us who our goal uh, in this space is, you know, we, we were, we were, our goal is all high schools uh, uh in the nation public high schools are required uh to have students take a personal finance course as a graduation requirement by 2030. that would be a great goal and mm -hmm. and and so maybe that's a little bit longer than three years but 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 that would be be the goal so so okay. a lot of progress is being made uh there's actually two other states that may cross the finish line before december so that would get us up even even higher to uh, say 16 states uh that to me that's critical the the other thing is uh when you look at getting this in schools i just focus on high school there, there are two issues one issue is uh the curriculum and you'll have people say oh you, you know this is going to cost money uh curriculum actually in this space you can get for free uh there's a great organization next gen personal finance i think they have uh the best curriculum 100 percent free always will be uh, uh, an individual started that with an, a lot of money from his own personal wealth. Uh, they probably have probably the most teachers in the country. Uh, I think about maybe 70,000 uh, uh, high school teachers are using it in their classrooms. 100% free. They also have a middle middle school module. What is it free. called? It's X-Gen? X-Gen Personal Finance. Personal Finance. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's a 100% free curriculum. There are other curriculum providers, for-profit, not-for-profit whose business model is to get curriculum into classrooms and their structure is set up that uh, if you use their curriculum, they, they will work with the schools to find a donor. 
who will pay for that curriculum if it That's costs great. money. So, so curriculum isn't the issue, but here's the real issue that isn't getting the demand that it needs. It's an area that I focus on. Uh, I've been doing a graduate level course for predominantly high school teachers on how to teach personal finance. The goal of the course is very simple. Give them the confidence and the skills and access to these free curriculum tools and classroom activities to successfully teach this in the classroom. The, the reality is personal finance is an orphan curriculum. Mm -hmm. It's new. These standards, mm -hmm. national standards didn't exist until around 1998, 1999. And it, it's never historically been part of, of any department. Mm -hmm. Whether that department's business or, or social studies. Well, they used to have, I mean, home economics was taught in school. I mean, girls, girls used to take home economics. I knew a couple yeah. of guys took home economics. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I did too. And, and that's a different thing because remember, you know, you also did cooking and yeah. sewing and, and a lot yeah. of different things. And it was really, if you go back to the history of home economics, and that's changed, they, they do this as well. But if you go back in time, it was really geared toward uh, helping housewives. And the budgeting was a, uh, a household budget. That's what they were focused on, not right. our retirement savings, uh, you know, in 401k and things of that nature. So, and those are the areas where, where, where teachers teach this. The reality is uh, teachers are not being taught how to teach this like they are other subject matters. Um, well, most of the teachers are screwed up economically. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and many states. And, I mean, I think they states, have their own problems. Yeah. Yeah, in many states, anybody can teach this. But to your point, which I think is a critical one, we've got to understand teachers are no more financially literate than anyone else who looks at them, looks like them by yep. age, right? Right. Or by education. Right. Uh, I've actually been involved in surveys in, the, in this area. And yeah, they, that's they, need, the they need to be they need to be taught more than anybody. Yeah, absolutely because, correct. Absolutely yeah. correct. So, John Pelletier, thank you very much for joining us this morning on Route 664, the Road to Human Kindness. And keep up the good work and pushing for financial literacy to make our economic world a better place to live in. And um, one of the things, again, love to see philanthropy in that curriculum somewhere. Um, anyway, I look forward to talking to you again, John. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks, Les. Take care. Take care. <laughs> so that was uh, John Pelletier, a very interesting gentleman and, uh, and one of the uh, pioneers in this area of financial literacy and bringing it into the high school so young people can learn how to be, become financially literate. It's very important. So I, one of the things I talked about with John was the idea of introducing philanthropy into this uh, mix. And uh, the reason why that's important is because it includes, it's, the, it's a holistic approach, a holistic approach to thinking about your financial literacy. And in that regard, it means not just about the bottom line of dollars that you're creating, but also <clears throat> what kind of legacy are you creating and uh, what kind of lifestyle do you want to live? And uh, what what is the relationship, you know, the family relationship to money? Those are all parts of the uh, those are all parts of the puzzle when we get to holistic when we get to holistic planning. So why are these things important? Um, it's important to, to look at this holistically because in that regard, you have some benefits that the government has given all of us. And I think that young people need to learn those benefits early because one of the things that they're going to go run into and that they're going to learn about quickly is taxes. Ew. <laughs> so taxes uh, are necessary. Uh, they're a necessary evil in order for there to be an organized structure to our, to our world. Uh, where we need to have some governmental control and taxes are a form of government. They are a form of social capital. <clears throat> and social capital is money that you're never going to get to spend on yourself or your children on your grandchildren. It's the capital that's going to be used to fund these taxes. Or the government gave us a choice. You can use that social capital to also fund charity. And this is where the social security comes in 
that we talk about on this program on Route 664, the Roman Road to Human Kindness. Because this number, this 664 trust, is a very important part of this whole puzzle. It helps you eliminate taxes while you grow your money. And that is a big advantage. Uh, you can do that with other things like a 401k, or you can do that with an IRA, or you can do that with a life insurance contract or with an annuity. All of those are ways to accumulate money with taxation being eliminated. And so one of the things that you need to learn to be financially literate is you want to do as much of that as you can to eliminate tax because tax robs the ultimate value that's going to be left behind. If you uh, have to pay taxes on every year when you make something, you have to pay a capital gains tax on it or you have to pay income tax on it. That diminishes the ultimate growth of that property. So you have a choice. Um, the government gave us this tool, the Section 664 Trust, in order for us to uh, put aside money. And I think what the, John was talking about when he was talking about saving Obviously, it's a very important aspect of this. If you save over a long period of time using compound interest and avoiding taxes, you really can grow money in a much better environment. So what a 664 trust allows an individual to do is they create a trust that's in their own name. So we can call this the John Doe Trust, John Doe Charitable Trust, Charitable Trust. And this is created by an individual for themselves, for them to use for their entire lifetime. And into that trust, you can put money or assets over time in any amount that you want. There's no limitation on the dollar, no limitation. So if you put a lot of money into this trust, during your lifetime as you're working, at the end, when this grows and it will grow through how you invest this, what is it invested in and how much is it earning, what percentage is it earning? And the fact that you don't have to pay tax on this while it grows is very important. The other thing that happens with this type of trust, and this is one of the things that's really great, is it's protected against a lot of potential risks. One risk is yourself. And what I mean by that is when you save in something other than this, if times get tough, what ends up happening is you start to erode it. And that's one of the things you can't do with a charitable trust. Second risk that can happen to it is somebody, a creditor, could try and take it from you or a disgruntled spouse. <laughs> okay. Uh, and that can't be done here either because this is not approachable by any creditor or a spouse. It's completely protected against that. And the last thing that it's protected against is the taxes, the risk of taxes. You can accumulate everything in this in a tax free environment. And at some point in time, you also are going to receive tax deductions for assets that you put into this trust. So this is a really powerful tool for financial literacy. And I believe that youngsters, uh, as young as 10, 11, 12, there's no reason why they couldn't open up a, a lemonade stand and sell lemonade and whatever the profit is from that lemonade stand, they can use that to, uh, to fund this type of a trust. They can start working that retirement early. Exactly. You can start working that retirement very early. And what it does is it teaches frugality. Mm -hmm. It teaches a lot of, a lot of uh, valuable lessons. But the most important lesson that it teaches is at the end of the uh, time when the individual has built this up and they've taken the income from it for their, for their lifetime. So they have this trust. It's huge now. It's got a lot of money in it. It's throwing off income to them. And then at the end, this is going to be left behind to a charity of their choice. And that's the, uh, and that's the road to human kindness, Route 664. Thanks for joining us. Our guest, John Peltier, thank you very much for John's 
uh, time. And um, if you want to learn more about what we're doing with Social Security, these devices, 664, go to the website, socialsecharity.org. Listen to the radio program at route664.org slash radio, great radio, dot org, dot org, route664.org. All right, thanks again. See you next week.